All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I see that uh, some folks are still kind of zooming in, uh, but I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar uh, hosted by the American German Institute, of course, formerly known as the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Eric Langenbacher, uh, a senior fellow and the directory, director of the Society, Culture and Politics program at AGI. And I'm really pleased to host today's uh, webinar, which is a book launch of a terrific new volume um, called the 2021 German Federal Election, uh, which is part of the um, Paul Graves series, New Perspectives in German Political Studies. So we have quite a few different contributions in uh, this edited volume. I should add that um, I also have a contribution uh, co-authored with the president of AGI, Jeff Rathke. Um, but today we are going to speak with the two editors of the volume. So we have uh, first Dr. Louise Davidson Schmich, who's a professor of political science at the University of Miami and the editor of the, well, competing journal, German Politics. Uh, her research interests include gender and sexuality in long-term democracy, such as Germany. Uh, at her university, she teaches all sorts of courses, the introduction to comparative politics, gender and politics, West European politics, LGBTI politics, and the comparative political economy of post-industrial democracies. And then coming in from Scotland, we have Dr. Ross Campbell, who's a senior lecturer in political science at the University of the West of Scotland. Uh, he's the associate editor of the Journal of Contemporary European Studies. He's the secretary of the International Association for the Study of German Politics. And his research interests are wide ranging, focusing on issues like the changing relationship between citizens and the state. So without further ado, I will hand the floor over to our illustrious speakers today, I think starting with uh, Ross. Let me mention to our webinar participants that um, after a brief presentation, we will have time for a question, question and answer period and a, and a more extended discussion. But I would ask that you please type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Then I will read those questions off. It gives me a chance to kind of combine questions and things like that. Uh, and also, I should note that we're not going to just talk about the contributions in the volume, but we're also going to talk about the relevance of the volume, the relevance of the contributions for what's going on in German politics today. So we will update things a little bit here and there, especially in the discussion. So the uh, floor is yours. Super. Can you all see the slides? Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks Eric for organizing uh, this webinar and thank you all for, for participating. And uh, before I get into the substantive part of what I'm gonna talk about, I wanna say a big word of thanks to all of the contributors uh, to the book for their hard work, uh, for the quality of the scholarship that they produced and for responding to our editorial queries with such uh, professionalism. We Really appreciated it. And one additional fact about this book that, that Louise and I, I think, are particularly proud of is that we deliberately invited younger scholars and emerging scholars uh, to take part so as to create a platform for their research and expand and diversify uh, the written scholarship on contemporary German politics. And all of those uh, younger scholars uh, delivered very well and that certainly augurs well for the future of the discipline. The book is divided into three parts. And in the first part, uh, we examine voting behavior and the political parties. And uh, this is certainly an area where long-term challenges have created a much more challenging political environment. Uh, so the evidence of this is uh, wide ranging. Uh, Germany is a typical case of a country in which the class and religious cleavages which defined party competition have eroded and possibly even been replaced with new lines of conflict. There's been partisan dealignment, which has been well documented in the literature. Partisan identifiers have uh, declined in number and their identifications have faded in intensity. Party membership is about halved over a period of about 30 years. 
and public images of political parties um, are particularly challenging. So together, uh, this creates um, a heightened part co party competition, more intense competition between parties for voters, greater electoral volatility. Uh, and in addition to that, we have the rise of issue and identity-based voting, uh, greater openness and fluidity in the electoral landscape, and a fragmentation of the party system. Now, I'm not suggesting that these are necessarily new things, but some of them have accelerated in ways that have made things increasingly challenging uh, for government formation. And these are the themes that emerge from that first uh, section uh, of the book, uh, a chapter on voting behaviour by Johannes Blumenberg demonstrated that compared with 2017, voters made their decisions much closer to the election, partly due to the absence of Angela Merkel as chancellor, but also because of the long-term changes that I've just discussed. Johannes also showed that a wider set of issues was considered by voters, enabling voters to move between parties and further eroding the structural loyalties that were once in place. In his thematic introduction to the political parties, Heinz Brandenburg did a fantastic job of highlighting some of the big themes with characteristic insight. Uh, Heinz highlighted three big trends. Uh, the first of those is the fragmentation of the party system with a higher number of effective parties now operating. The second is polarization, denoting the degree of ideological difference between the parties and something which he found was sharper in the East compared with the West of the country. And thirdly, a uh, trend that Heinz um, highlighted was volatility. Uh, he pointed out that 2021 was the fourth election in a row where volatility was higher than at any point between 1953 and 2005. And so within that environment, there were winners and losers. And as Ed Turner and colleagues show, the SPD benefited from sound strategic choices, a more disciplined campaign, and its positioning on fiscal issues and the reputation of Olaf Scholz. For the union, meanwhile, uh, Sarah Williarty showed that it entered the contest with intra-party conflict rumbling on, a chancellor candidate that lacked credibility and a manifesto that lacked ambition. Uh, they lost votes, the union lost votes across key demographics, but particularly amongst women. For the Greens, they entered the campaign for a period of time in which there was a realistic prospect of them coming first. Uh, as Chantelle Sullivan Thomas shows, Despite the salience of climate change in the election, the selection of Annalena Baerbock as Chancellor candidate, gaffes and a lacklustre campaign um, combined to leave them disappointed uh, to be in third place. For the FDP, David Patton um, wrote a, an insightful chapter in which he showed how they had a, a particularly successful campaign uh, they championed the modernization agenda, weaving together themes like digitalization and education, but also arguing that it was a precondition to a more efficient government. It was a strategic pitch as a forward-looking and tech-savvy party. For the AFD, it continues to carve out a, a stable presence in the party system. Um, as Jonathan Olson and Michael Hansen showed, its core themes were all there, Islamophobia, nationalism, disillusionment with the mainstream parties, but the messaging was, was different and they operated as a, a kind of issue entrepreneur. For the left party, it was a, a, a disaster. Um, it was the disaster that a lot of people expected it to be and the party returned to the Bundestag only via the clauses, the esoteric clauses of German election law. Um, Dan Hoff wrote uh, a chapter for us on the left party, and he showed that there was a lack of clarity about what the party stands for, poor messaging, 
uh, intra-party conflict, lack of credible leadership, and a campaign that was in, in large part a stale rerun of the greatest hits of its previous campaigns. Uh, Dan has been writing about the, the left party since well before it was the left party, and, and, and such is the, uh, the depths into which it's descended. Um, I was wondering last night whether or not that may well be his last ever um, chapter on, on the left party. Um, and, and wrapping all of those things together, uh, Charlie Lee's um, showed that the election culminated in a more complex process of government formation. Um, and one specifically where the politics of centrality that we're all familiar with, he argues, has been replaced with a politics of fluidity, key features of which are more protracted negotiation processes and greater difficulty in reaching um, compromise. So those are the, the big themes that I, I drew out from the first uh, section of the book, and I'll pass you over now to Louise. Thanks, Ross. Um, and I should also say to everybody, uh, we owe Ross a special thanks because it's Friday night in Scotland. So it's not like he's spending his lunch hour doing this talk. Um, thanks to Eric and the American German Institute for having us. Um, it's great to have people attend too and know when you put all the effort into writing a book that people are interested in learning what it says. So thanks to those of you who have come. And again, I would also give a shout out to our contributors who, um, we, you know, Ross and I signed this contract with Paul Grave, and then I had a little bit of buyer's remorse because I realized we just committed to writing a book with 23 chapters and some chapters having multiple authors. And I just thought this is going to become a real herding cats type of experience. Um, but it turned out actually that our, our contributors were great um, and, and you know, got their job done on time and, and got their chapters in. And I, I learned a lot from this book, so I would definitely recommend it to you. Uh, the second section of the book focuses on foreign relations. And before we get going, I'll say that that um, might seem like a strange choice, because if we jump ahead to our issue section, we'll see that this was not an election that was really about foreign relations or foreign policy at all. It was not top of mind for voters. It was not voters' top concerns. If we look at what the parties talked about, what they tweeted about, the issues that they stressed, parties also weren't stressing um, foreign relations or foreign affairs in their electoral campaigns either. Um, and the start of this section, written by Kai Opperman, talks, I think, and helps us understand a little bit about why foreign relations were such a silent topic um, in this election. And Ty Kai talks about how German elites are in a real um, difficult position right now, caught between a rock and a hard place. One side being, if we look at uh, the United States and Germany's NATO partners and its EU partners, a lot of pressure on Germany to step up its role, even before the invasion of Ukraine, um, in terms of modernizing its military, increasing spending on, on military actions, and contributing more to defending the Western alliance and the liberal order. Um, on the other hand, elites are also faced with a mass public that's uh, been called in other quarters a civilian state, people who are not really enthusiastic about military spending or military actions or thinking about, um, about military ways of solving conflicts or even unilateral action on the part of Germany. Um, and so I think in that context, it's much easier to run an election campaign without thinking about or without talking about foreign affairs very much so you don't... Um, don't have to take a stance between these two competing sides. Um, as a result, when Germany's new three-party coalition formed, foreign affairs and foreign policy points weren't top of mind. This wasn't a, a, an alliance that was formed on the basis of a foreign policy agenda, but much rather on um, the basis of a domestic agenda. And as Ross just said, uh, when you have a three-party coalition, it's difficult to agree um, on all sorts of different things if you're trying to collaborate with three parties. But I think it's especially difficult to collaborate if um, the issues weren't really even talked about or brought to the forefront earlier in the election campaign. Um, and so you can see here on the screen the way our chapter is broken down. It's into four chapters uh, that focus on Germany's relations with other 
world players, including the United States, Russia, the UK, and the European Union. And each of these chapters looks at the, the status quo before the election, what were relations like under the Merkel era. They look at what went on and what was discussed, not so much in the party's election campaigns, but at least what was written in their electoral platforms. Where did parties stand on these issues? And what happened um, as a result in the coalition agreement? And I think all of this is really important because even though this wasn't an election about foreign policy, and even though voters didn't really maybe care about this so much or parties foreground this, it very quickly became a coalition that had to govern in an era of key foreign policy changes. Of course, the invasion of the Ukraine, which is included in our book. And now if we think ahead and we look at the conflict in Gaza, we can see these, these pressures to think about foreign policy continue. And I think if we want to understand how Germany's reacted to the Ukraine war and how Germany's reacted in its terms of its foreign policy today, it's useful to go back and look at the election and think about what was in these platforms and these campaigns and what this coalition is trying to reconcile when it governs Germany. Uh, to some degree, there was large agreement in these party platforms of the, the SPD, the FDP, and the um, Green Party in terms of some key pillars of foreign policy. They were certainly um, all in agreement on the importance of transatlantic ties and seeing the United States as a key partner. They were all um, very much pro-EU. There's not, not Eurosceptic parties among them. Um, most of them were content to more or less continue along some of the lines that the Merkel government uh, pursued vis-a-vis -vis the EU. All of these parties were unhappy with the UK as a result of Brexit and had um, you know, saw strains on the relationship because of that. Although all key players too have some underlying connections to the to the UK, they speak English. Um, they've spent time there. They know some of the key players there. So I think there's the potential for improved relations. But certainly at the time of the election, um, Brexit was still fresh in the minds. I think of all these parties. Um, and finally, all of the parties agree that they wanted to continue the sanctions that were in place for Russia for its, its foreign policy aggression um, prior to the election. But those broad agreements mask some underlying details um, that I think um, make it difficult for these parties to always agree or to act unilaterally on foreign policy. Um, one of those had to do with the question of a European army. Um, the SPD and the FDP were in favor of moving forward in that direction, whereas the Greens, they did want greater um, military cooperation among EU member states, but they weren't, weren't interested in the creation of a European army. Um, if we look at the longstanding desire for Germany to spend 2% of its GDP on um, military readiness, um, in the election campaign, the FDP was the only one of the, the Ampel coalition partners that favored that stance. Um, if we think about their stances on Russia and China, there were some underlying disagreements here too. Um, the SPD policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia was described by our chapter authors as one of muddling through and being very vague and not particularly clear about what um, the SPD thought in the campaign Germany should be doing vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, the SPD was silent in its platform about um, the North Stream 2 pipeline. On the other hand, the Greens and the FDP were a lot clearer about viewing Russia as a potential threat and viewing Russia as a potential threat because it was not democratic. Um, the Greens out and out wanted to stop the Nord Stream pipeline. The FDP called for um, an, a moratorium that was indefinite, so it wasn't really clear when this moratorium was supposed to end. Um, and both of them were pretty clear on wanting a values-based foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, and if we look at what emerged in the coalition agreement, we can see and detect some of this underlying disagreement. Um, the coalition agreement doesn't even mention the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, and the coalition agreement said, on the one hand, it wanted to have a quote unquote constructive dialogue with Russia, but on the other hand, it said it wanted to pursue a more values-based foreign policy. So there didn't seem to be really any kind of reconciling um, of the two sides positions about what to do with Russia. But I think at the time in the fall of 2020, or the fall of 2021, um, I think there was probably not a, an expectation that we were going to see um, an outright invasion of the Ukraine shortly thereafter. 
Um, the chapter on the EU by Teresa Novotna also goes into Germany's relationship with China and the EU's relationship with China. And we can see some of these tensions emerging again um, among the coalition partners, where Schultz's SPD has been a lot more um, interested in stressing business ties with China. Um, under Schultz's administration, Germany sold a quarter of the stake of a container port in Hamburg to China against the opposition of the Greens. Um, Schultz traveled to China with the CEOs of 12 German firms, including Volkswagen and the Deutsche Bank, um, right after the Chinese president had been reappointed for an unprecedented fourth term without uh, much contestation. Um, and this trip to China was undertaken unilaterally on Germany's part without cooperation um, with France. President Macron had wanted to attend um, and it, um, Schultz's presence there with a bunch of business leaders didn't quite communicate the same human rights concerns um, that the Greens and the FDP had. So I think all of these chapters point to the potential for continued tension among coalition partners about how to deal with some of these key issues. Um, and it really points to um, the, the chapters also talk, especially um, Eric and Jeff's chapter about the United States, talk about the rollout of Schultz's Seitenwende, right, his promise to start spending a lot more on the military. We've seen that's been a slow and rocky rollout that hasn't yielded a lot of concrete results in a, a, a very quick way. Um, and if we look to the future of what's going on in Europe and the U.S. involvement um, with the Ukraine, we see that there's a potential for Germany to be put in an even more um, rock in a hard place kind of position. Um, reluctance on the part of certain actors in the United States to continue to fund the Ukraine, the potential for a Trump uh, victory in, in the fall of 2024, where Trump's outright said, you know, he's going to leave Europe on its own, is going to put Germany in a position where it's probably going to need to either um, spend a lot more on military and take a lot more greater role in military affairs against with what a lot of uh, the population wants, um, or it's going to see a really changing security situation in Europe without taking a lot of, of lead. Um, and so our authors call some of these outcomes a nightmare, so a nightmare scenario or um, a real dilemma for Germany going forward. So uh, I think including foreign affairs in the in the book about the election turned out to be a really useful contribution of this volume that we certainly didn't see coming when we put together the volume in the first place. Um, so on that note, I'll end and I'll switch back over to Ross to start talking about the third section of the book. I am gonna be much briefer on this section, chance to contribute. Um, and I want to start with a big word of thanks to Constantine Worthman, who has an excellent uh, overview of the salience of particular issues, uh, the competition for them uh, amongst political parties. Um, he, he really did a, an excellent job. Um, two of those issues were conspicuous by their absence. Um, uh, Andreas Bush uh, entitled his chapter uh, COVID-19, The Dog That Didn't Bark, um, and he set out some prescient uh, polling data from Forschungsgruppe showing um, how the salience of COVID-19 just, just dropped off from the February before the election. Um, it was almost as though voters had come to the conclusion that the pandemic was now in the past and that they were making much more of a judgment on, on what would uh, happen next. Uh, similarly with the economy, actually, it was not a particularly salient issue in the election. Um, and, and to me, actually, the big message to draw out from both of those chapters is a kind of rebuke to academics because we tend to think things are important and voters have completely different ideas about what's important to them. And um, COVID-19 and the economy just didn't feature um, in the same extent. There was discussion about the Schuldenbremse, the debt break. Uh, there was discussion about pensions. There was discussion about tax. 
Um, but really the core of um, the election, from the point of view of the issues that voters were mentioning, was the environment, climate change, a perception of a, a, a much more deepening climate crisis. And Carol Hager uh, did an excellent job of setting that out, um, showing that it occurred against the perceptions of a deepening climate crisis, uh, a ruling from the Constitutional Court for the government to accelerate action on it, and, and lively debates about how Germany was going to meet its obligations um, whilst also undergoing a, a kind of socially just transformation of the economy. There is a ton of things packed in the air um, that I would highlight. The chapters are excellent. Thanks to your contributors. And I'll hand you back now to Louise for, I think, uh, final issues. Thanks, Ross. Um, the subtitle of our introduction and conclusion to this volume is Negotiating a New Era. Um, and in part, that new era of German politics is one where, as we've seen before, we have um, much more fluid voter behavior, much more fragmented kind of a party system. But this is, I think, also, um, given the result of this election, a new era in some policy areas, uh, especially the last three that we talk about here in the book, immigration, gender, um, and LGBTI issues. If we think about 2021, it marks the end of 16 years of Christian democratic rule in Germany. So if we think about the, the SPD and the FDP, they tend to be a little bit more progressive, or they're not tend to be, they're definitely more progressive on social issues than the CDU. But in coalition with the CDU, both of those parties put a lot of the social agenda um, on the back burner to focus on other affairs. And so... Um, this new traffic light coalition is a coalition among uh, three different parties that have much more progressive ideas on immigration, gender, and LGBT issues than did the CDU. And so there's a lot of opportunity here for them um, to, as, to espouse a big policy agenda, sort of making up for lost time um, in a lot of areas that all three of these parties, I think, would have liked to address across the last 16 years, but they didn't have an opportunity to do that. Um, and so I'll start off by talking about immigration, uh, the chapter by Hannah Alarin and James Fahey. Um, and they found that in comparison to 2017, immigration was not quite this um, as prominent of an issue in the 2021 election as it had been before. Um, but it certainly was one that had a lot of polarization and discussion across the electorate about um, what immigration means as an issue, how we want to treat immigration um, and integration of new residents in Germany. Um, and their chapter does a wonderful job of analyzing the programs of each of these three parties and analyzing, well, actually analyzing the programs of all parties contesting the election, um, but especially the three that formed the traffic light coalition, and then examining the coalition agreements. And what they find is, and I'm going to quote them here because I think they say it nicely, immigration is now portrayed as an opportunity to seize rather than a burden to be borne. Um, so Germany's immigration policy views immigration as a positive. Now we can see, for example, um, the coalition has already made some reforms uh, enabling dual citizenship and making it easier uh, for people to obtain German citizenship and, and obtain it more quickly. Um, so there's widespread agreement among these parties um, on many things that are related to immigration and the policies that they're putting forward are much more nuanced than uh, target a much greater range of groups than we've seen um, under the Merkel administration before. I'm gonna skip down for a second and talk about LGBTI issues, which is the focus of Phil Ayub's chapter. Um, and he describes the results of the election as a new chapter for LGBT rights in Germany. Um, and he writes, the 2020 elections bring new luster to LGBTI issues in Germany in terms of issue salience and representation with the potential to transform Germany from an adopter back into an innovator on LGBT rights. Um, so this coalition had widespread agreement on a very large agenda item of issues of interest um, to LGBT citizens. They've appointed the Germany's first LGBTI commissioner, who's a green, um, Sven Lehmann, and he's overseeing a national action plan on LGBT issues. Um, the, the coalition has already passed some legislation on this, and they have a, a robust legislation, a robust legislative agenda um, going forward. So I think we're going to see um, a lot more action on these issues than we did under the Merkel government. 
Um, Germany also has a record number um, and diversity of LGBTI elected officials. So the Bundestag now um, contains 33 members who self-identify as LGBT, um, including the first trans Germans, um, the first bisexual woman, and um, some gay men with migration backgrounds. Um, the gender chapter by Sabina Lang paints a little bit more of a mixed picture. Um, all three of these parties have sp spoke out in their platforms about uh, moving forward on gender equality. Um, the SPD and the Greens also have a number of women um, within their ranks. If we look at the Green delegation in the Bundestag right now, it has 59% women, as opposed to the AfD, um, whose delegation has 13%. Um, this is not the high, martyr, high water mark for women's representation in the Bundestag, but it comes close and it's an increase over 2017. Schultz's cabinet was a parody cabinet. Um, and rhetorically, the coalition agreement makes a lot of promises about considering gender and moving forward toward gender equality. One of the things that the coalition agreement promises is a, a gender check, or basically a, a, the um, promise to vet all sorts of laws that go that get put forward in terms of their in terms of their gendered impacts. Um, but as Sabina Lang points out, a lot of these things are. Um, basically what we would call in American politics, unfunded mandates. So they're jobs that are put on um, bureaucrats and people within the public administration without the resources really to carry these out. And so I think we can see there some of the FDP's reluctance to spend on gender equality. Um, and another lost opportunity that she talks about um, is a, a both the Greens and the SPD had a lot of plans and their platforms to think about how electoral reform in Germany could lead to greater gender equality in political representation, um, something that the FDP starkly opposed. And if we look at the electoral reforms that have been passed in Germany, preliminary evidence suggests that those are probably not going to increase women's representation. Um, so more of a mixed bag on gender, but certainly a new era in terms of immigration and LGBTI issues. So I think with that, we'll we'll stop talking and let people ask their questions about the book. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for um, a great overview with um, really, I think, important contributions to understanding the 2021 Bundestag election and its consequences. So we actually already do have a question in the Q&A, so I will save my questions for later. Um, let me also encourage all of our participants to type your questions into the Q&A function, and then we can um, uh, get to them. So here's one from um, Sven Siefkin, and it was, um, I guess, a, a comment and a question related to something that Ross said um, towards the beginning about declining party identification, that indeed party identification has declined from 80% to 60% uh, since the 1970s but it's still quite high compared to um, several other European countries, not even to mention the United States. Um, and the same thing goes for fragmentation and volatility, that yes, those have increased, but they're less than what we would see in, in many comparable European countries. Um, so is the glass half empty or half full? I mean, I guess just to kind of add on to that, you know, how significant are these kind of trends uh, to understand the future of German politics? Yeah, is the glass half full or half empty? Maybe we can agree that the glass is not full. Maybe there is a legitimate debate about how far it will empty, how you know how low it will go from here. Um, I think for me, this theme came up in a webinar that I participated in about a year and a half ago. And the moderator was looking at the UK as one of the most stable democracies that he had grown up with. He was German. He was looking at the UK as one of the most stable democracies. And I'm looking at the Federal Republic as I grew up with it as one of the most stable democracies that that, that was around. I mean, elections just were boring. There, there, there was nothing to them. The CDU won. It, it was academic tourism masquerading as scholarly activity when you went to an election trip. Um, but I do think there is now, these trends are all combining, and I think that's one of the points that comes out from the party's uh, literature and, and some of the chapters in our, in our book is that 
the combination of these factors is creating um, greater competition, a propensity for voters quite seamlessly now to move between parties, um, to split tickets. And I think the, 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 the combination of all of that is going to make elections um, much more unpredictable than they were in the past. Um, to me, I mean, if I go back to like 1998 or or before, um, I mean, you could look at the results and say, well, does two two percentage points, you know, does two percentage points really make that much of a difference? Probably not. But two percentage points now could be the margin of victory, um, such as the you know, you know, the kind of uh, changing nature of, of German, of the German electorate. So yes, these things matter. Um, we can probably dispute the direction in which all of those, those trends are headed. But the reality of what we've got just now is a more volatile, more fragmented, more polarized um, party system and electorate than, than I've seen before. Yeah. I, I think I think one of the things that comes out in the book is how many, there's a really large number of people who are undecided until the very last minute, right? And so that's that makes election campaigns a lot more salient if people, if you've got a big chunk of voters who don't know what they're going to do until they walk into the voting booth. Um, and I think I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is, the, is to look at that data generationally. Um, and I think what we're seeing is some of that stability in the system is driven by older voters. And I think some of the volatility is drive, driven by younger voters. And of course, as we move through time, we're going to see more younger voters and fewer older ones. No, I was, I was just going to add two thoughts. The first is that, you know, if we were having this webinar in February of 2021, the polling looked really different than the actual result. So, you know, it shows just how many late deciders there are. It shows how things that happened on the campaign, um, you know, like when Lashett smiled at the back of, you know, an event for victims of the flooding in the Atal. I mean, so who knows um, uh, with the electorate that we have today. That being said, I mean, the polling does mean something. And if you look at the current polling, you know, since the election, I mean, it, it seems like there's even more fragmentation and volatility that's happening. I was just looking at the latest Forschungsgruppe Wahlen uh, polling, and the FDP and the the left are below the five percent threshold at four percent, which isn't to say that you know eighteen months from now when the election takes place that they won't make it over there. But we have a new grouping as well, and I, I wanted to bring this up because you know Ross was talking about how Dan Huff might be out of a job if he um, won't be able to write about the left party anymore. But now we have this Budnis Sahavakinik <laughs> also on the kind of populist left that seems to be siphoning a lot of the. Um, support that used to go to the left party, but also to an extent to the AFD as well. The AFD is also down a little bit from their recent polling highs. I think I saw them at 19%, which is down from 20 to 22% that they were doing late last year. So there is, I, I think there's more fluidity. There seems to be more fragmentation. But you know, on that particular note, I'd love to hear from Louise and Ross about this new Sarah Wagenknecht um, grouping. Um, which actually has consistently gotten four, six, I think I even saw 7% in one poll. So it's not just a flash in the pan, but of course it will matter immensely if they come in at 4% in an election or if they come in at 6%. So any thoughts on, you know, what role that new grouping is playing and what their prospects might be? Yeah, I mean, I think I would prefer to wait until I see some actual votes. Um, We've got European parliamentary elections coming up in June. Uh, there's land elections in Saxony, Thuringia, and Brandenburg in September. Um, that's going to be a real test of whether or not this U party has any traction in the areas where voters are saying that they are going to vote for it. You know, there is always a difference between intentions and reality. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forestall serious comment on that until I see actually where where the votes go at, at an election. I mean, I think that the only thing we've got really is is a few polls and something like a question that was, you know, if Sarah Wagenknecht formed this party, would you consider voting for it? 
And I think it's danger to extra it's dangerous to extrapolate from hypotheticals in that in that scenario. We don't know what borders are going to do. Other issues could be in play. Um, we'll see. Louise, I'll let you. Yeah, I I was going to say, and I think it's, you know, the European election is coming. The European Parliament election is coming up, right? But even those are second order elections where people might actually be more willing to vote for something like the Bundesrepublik than they would be if they were voting in a national election. So I'm not even sure if mm. what, you know what we see in the EP election might translate um, nationally. I think. One thing that is also notable about the last election is we can look at the the percentage of the votes that went to other and the percentage of votes going to other has gone up. Um, and so I think that there definitely is a willingness of people to vote for parties that don't seem, you know, don't seem to have a realistic chance um, in elections. And so I'm not sure if that's a if that's a permanent trend or if maybe people will figure out maybe they don't want to do that after a while, but I think it is noteworthy. And somebody I saw in the chat, somebody's asking about um, voter behavior among younger people. And I think there's a good example where I think younger people might be more willing to vote for new parties or parties that we haven't seen before. Otherwise, the youth vote definitely in the in the um, 2021 election was kind of split between the Greens and the FDP were the most popular among young voters. Yeah, and now with the FDP doing so poorly, I mean, the Greens seem to have stabilized about four, around 14, 15%, but the FDP is way down from the 2021 um, uh, outcome. So it'll be interesting to see where those younger voters back in 2021 go um, in uh, 2025. Uh, we have another question here. This is from uh, Mark Hassel. Um, on Putin's invasion of Ukraine and how it has changed everything. Just, I can't resist an editorial note on that. You know, I once heard uh, somebody assess what had happened after uh, Putin's invasion just about two years ago. And um, somebody said that the problem with this ample government, this traffic-like coalition, is that it was a peacetime government that's now forced to deal with a wartime situation. So a real kind of disconnect between what they thought they were going to be able to do and what they're confronted with in real time. But getting back to Mark's question, so the book was, um, I think, well, actually, I think that in our chapter, for instance, we were able to accommodate the invasion of Ukraine. So it's not entirely true that the book was written before the war, but certainly it, it, the book wasn't able to accommodate all of the ramifications of Putin's invasion. But the question is, what are some of the ideas in the book that help us to understand how Germany will move forward? Yeah, and I think some of it is exactly what you said, Eric, that this was not a coalition that was that ever anticipated or thought about handling a land war in Europe. I mean, that just wasn't on that wasn't on anybody's agenda. And it was a coalition that was very much came into being because of a domestic agenda. And I think that's what voters saw this as being an election about domestic issues. So in some respects, I think the book sort of primes us to see what we've been seeing playing out is that there's a lot of tension within the coalition. There's difficulties. Um, you know, it's it's um, Teresa Novotna talks in her chapter about Schultz's leadership style. And if we think about Merkel, right, Merkel spent um, a lot of her career kind of working behind the scenes to kind of bring everybody together. And then only when everyone was all on board with something that she would make some kind of an announcement in a very incremental kind of fashion, right? Whereas we see somebody like Schultz taking the stage saying it's a sight and then that everything's changed where maybe there's not the groundwork laid to actually get that change made or get everyone on board for that change made immediately. So I think, you know, Schultz talked a, a, a big game when he made his Zeit and Wende speech. And I think we've seen, and I think the book does take this into account because the chapters were actually written after the invasion, um, that Germany has been very slow to roll out some of those promises. And I think the book helps us understand why, because this is, you know, this is not what they were intending to do. And I think another really significant thing um, that we haven't talked about, and you don't mention in your question mark, but I think is important has been this um, this court ruling that says you can't just like fake your accounting and um, spend money willy nilly and say you're avoiding the debt break, right? And so um, I think a lot of the what was going into what was decided upon on this coalition was kind of. Um, predicated on the fact that she could have some of the social spending and some of the environmental spending that the Greens and the SPD wanted. And you could draw that from a Zukunftsfund that was somehow exempt from um, other accounting laws. And so that's put a huge strain on the coalition 
And I think that would have been in place regardless of the Ukraine. But of course, the Ukraine conflict and the need to spend on the military just exacerbates all of this. You want to add anything, Ross? Um, I, I, I don't know that the role of the military has ever really featured in a in an election campaign. And and I remember when we were on the election trip talking to a couple of people and saying, oh, we've been at all these events and there's been lots of questions about foreign policy. But but why? Because there surely isn't a voter in Germany sitting around saying, um, oh, we really must do much more in Kazakhstan, therefore I'll vote for party X. But I think what, what has happened as a consequence of this is that all sorts of other issues are now going to come into play. Um, the, the supply lines to Russian nat nat natural gas that were built up under Merkel and, and taken and progressed with Merkel even after uh, Putin's agenda in Crimea had become clear, um, looked misguided and cast a black mark on her legacy as chancellor. Um, and it, so at the same time, there are, there are domestic issues that can, can be thrown up by foreign policy. And we wanted to take that into account in the book. We wanted to mention that, um, particularly because thinking about other foreign policy challenges that there are likely to be, China, for example, um, but also the kind of underlying principle of German, one of the underlying principles of German foreign policy, namely that you can kind of trade your way into good relations with people, that that, that you can, by trading with people, you'll, you'll resolve conflicts and all the rest of it. That that looks to me to be to be dead in the water as, as a defensible principle, but what's going to replace it, I have no idea, um, because the National Security Strategy document, that, that was published uh, in the summer and all sorts of proposals that had looked quite um, that had looked quite quite serious were watered down as a consequence. So so um, equally, when Schultz made the Zeitenwende speech, I, I would love to know if he had actually discussed that with his foreign minister um, before saying it, because because the implementation of it was going to be through Annalena Baerbock. And so was there a shared understanding of what it meant and how it would be implemented? Or was this just another um, kind of technocratic policy announcement? I'm skeptical. But foreign policy, I think, will come back at the next election. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly looking at a lot of the polling, that's the case. Um, so we have another question from Sven, who's really doubling down on um, pushing back on this notion that polarization has increased, for instance. So he notes that um, uh, COVID and climate change were not so important during uh, th that 2021 election. They weren't wedge issues because all the parties, except for the AFD, of course, um, agreed on a basic level about that there was something that needed to be done. So because of that, these issues lost salience. And is this a consequence of competition for the center in German politics, as he puts it, i.e. the reverse of polarization? I would say, I mean, I think we have good evidence that certainly COVID was the dog that didn't bark, right? That was, I think people were just like, been there, done that. I don't want to think about the pandemic anymore. But the environment was a, was a huge issue. I think I, I had, didn't look at the graphs last night, but it might have been the most the most important issue or one of the most important issues. So I, um, I, 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 that was an important issue in the campaign. And I think we can see if we look at the campaigns that were put forward, uh, that there's that people agree that climate, well, well, I'm going to leave the AfD aside, right? But the other parties agree that climate change is a problem and that Germany needs to do something about it. And I think that we can see some real party competition over the question of how we're going to address this. And I think that's part of the tensions within the coalition. And you could even see during the campaign, there was very much, especially um, between the Greens and the, the um, FDP, real dissensus about how you want to handle that. I went, um, so I, I think we failed to say at the beginning of this talk that our, the book sprang from the um, International Association for the Study of German Politics election trip um, to Berlin to watch these elections play out in real time. And so one of the um, 
uh, luxuries that that trip allowed us to do was to actually go and watch the um, electoral, um, you know, election events right up um, before the election. So Eric, I know that you were you were there with me. We went to go see um, Christian Lindner and his Abschlusswahlkampf, his last, um, the FDP's kind of last big hurrah before the election. And Christian Lindner was standing there yelling at the Greens and saying, you know, I think it's so much, you know, the way to combat climate change isn't to forbid people from taking train trips or to take plane trips, but, you know, you should let me drive down the Autobahn at 100 miles an hour in my Tesla that's electric, um, you know, rather than curbing speed limits. That is, we should use market innovation and we should and use, you know, positive things to address climate change and not be the party of forbidding um, things. And if, certainly if we look at the Greens, there were an awful lot of prohibitions or plans for um, limiting what people could do vis-a-vis -vis climate change. So I think that there was a substantive disagreement over these issues about climate change and that they were important. That, that, also, that actually flows really nicely into our next question, um, which is that uh, we all know that there's been constant infighting, especially over the last few months amongst the three coalition partners. And so they they all have kind of like middling um, rates of support. You know, I was thinking the other day that has there ever been a government with so much less than majority support in the polling in post-war Germany? I'm not sure that there have been too many that are this unpopular. Um, that's for sure. But what's interesting, if you look at the three parties, the Greens are about where they were in the 2021 election. The SPD is down substantially and the FTP has just almost utterly collapsed as we noted before, below the 5% threshold. So why is it, do you think, that the Greens are maintaining a, a decent level of support, but the other two coalition partners have plummeted? Ross, do you want to take that or should I? That's a hard question because I think actually, if you look at the coalition agreement, um. I didn't see the Greens get a lot out of it. I mean, I think in reading it, if you implemented everything that the Greens wanted, it it doesn't get you it doesn't get you close to the climate change targets. So, if you're looking at the program for government and combining that with the very clear direction that the voters had given the government. Green voters probably get very good reasons to be disappointed. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're maybe they've got a particularly loyal following. Maybe we're talking about the Fundy Greens here. The thirteen percent are the Fundy Greens. Um, but it does strike me that that maybe or maybe there is greater volatility amongst the rest of the, the rest of the parties. I don't know. Maybe those numbers are a bit soft. I mean, let, let's let's wait for the rest of the year. We're going to be in September. We're going to be a year from the next federal elections. But yeah, I'm just conscious of the gap between the policy direction given to the government in the data, all of which was pointing to the fact that climate change and climate issues were front and centre for voters. What was cooked up in the coalition agreement, what they've got out of it, um, just doesn't just doesn't meet their ambitions. But yet their numbers are still doing very well. Um, but yeah, you're right, Eric. This is an incredibly unpopular government. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the 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 polling numbers for 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 the governing parties are shocking. The evaluation think, of them as a government is shocking. I mean, I well, I mean, I think their performance as a government is not good in terms of um, if we think about putting. A, a united front or a leadership front out in front, right? We can see, I mean, the FDP seems to be permanently obstructionist or, mm -hmm. or going against the coalition. And I think I think that obviously doesn't seem to resonate with voters. I mean, I think if you, um, they're, I think they're much more likely to speak out against their other coalition partners. And I think the, the Greens and the SPD have maybe done a little bit better job of softening the differences. And I think that's probably part of what it is for the FDP, especially because if we think about if you were an FDP voter, I know many people were frustrated in 2017 when Lindner pulled out of the coalition talks, right? And so he he you know left the government in 2017, and now in 2021 he seems to be um, 
you know, a, a thorn in the side of the coalition. So it could be that voters, FDP voters are just saying, it, I'm not getting what I'm wanting out of Lindner because he doesn't seem to be able to play well with others. I don't, Scholz, I mean, I, I'm not sure that Scholz is, um, you know, he has a reputation for being a scholz o -Matt, right? He's not, I haven't seen him kind of, at the sight and then his speech was maybe inspiring, but other than that, I haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, it's almost like, a, I think I've seen a meme about this instead of where's Waldo, where's w Olaf? He seems to be kind of in the background and letting his other coalition partners um, dispute a lot of stuff. And so I think maybe some of the SPD suffering might just simply be that that Olaf Schultz doesn't seem like a um, a strong ma coalition manager, really. Um, and maybe um, for the Greens, you know, if you think about their most prominent minister, it's probably Baerbach as a foreign minister, and she's gone around the world and she's had a lot to do and made a lot of pronouncements. And you know, looks other than the fact that her plane couldn't get to her from Australia or what problem she had there. Generally, she's, I think, done um, very well as a foreign minister. And that's certainly a high profile role that, that people can see and attach to the Greens. All right, I see that we're almost out of time. And I feel like we're circling back to some of the structural themes that we talked about at the very beginning, the fragmentation, the polarization. Yes, Sven, we took your point, the volatility, right? And of course, um, just to kind of reemphasize, this is the first time there's been a three-party coalition at the national level. I'm not treating the CSU as a separate party, okay? Um, and so, and that's probably going to be the new normal going forward. I mean, even if the AFD weakens a bit, they're going to get at least 15% of the vote, I would I would think, and as high as maybe 20%, hopefully not any more than that, right? And so you, you're going to have to build a coalition with, um, what? 75 or 80 percent of the seats so i think that the future will be continued three-party governments which means that we'll probably have a future of very dissatisfied germans because i think that almost all of the dissatisfaction is coming from the fact that you have three very disparate parties with very different visions of what they want for the future the constant negotiation and compromise is just something that leaves people dissatisfied so you know this is probably the new normal yeah, oh. or if I may interrupt, I think also that's something Germany maybe needs to consider, which I know Germans don't like, is the concept of minority government, right? If we think about a red green government that could uh, could govern with agreement on the CDU on some things or agreement on the FDP with some things, but that's that's not in the German discourse. But I think it would be it's another solution than chronic coalition fights and instability. I think in a, a multi party setting like this. Yeah, and then the only other thing that I would just highlight, right? Again, I'm not trying to overinterpret the polls, but I think it was after the 2013 election that something like 16 or 17 percent of the votes went to parties that ended up not getting seats. And if certain things hold, right, or depending on how things go, we could have an even higher proportion of voters having no representation in the parliament for their um, for their preferred parties, which should bring up all sorts of questions about democratic representation and just how well-functioning uh, Germany is. Uh, maybe Germany's not going to be the model that it was when you were growing up, Ross. Um, and maybe the UK will be back as uh, another kind of, you know, top-notch, well-functioning model. The, the future's wide open. All right, um, any I'm final here. thoughts? <laughs> No, I'm I'm still trying to digest that one, Eric. The UK back is a well-functioning democracy. Okay, yeah. Um, one can dream. Compared um, to the US? Yeah, we, we didn't talk about the US, actually. And, you know, the outcomes in November um, and the potential for them to reshape uh, the political system in Germany... Um, are really quite extraordinary. It's certainly been something I've been thinking about in the last week or so because there was headline news in the UK about Trump's statement that he would actively encourage Putin to attack NATO allies. And I think Schultz hit back pretty much immediately to say, you know, we've got plans for um, we've got plans in case Trump wins. So it, it is an incredibly tense situation, but I can't ever in my life think of a situation where a candidate for president of the United States actively encouraged a dictator to attack NATO allies. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy times.
Well, you know, that's an excellent note to kind of end on because um, I want to tell everybody who's listening to this, either in real time or on a recording, that the American German Institute will be devoting a lot of attention to the upcoming um, 2024 presidential election in the United States and its consequences. So you can look forward to quite a few po uh, publications, podcasts, and of course, webinars uh, to try to understand what's going on with that and then to analyze the results once they come in. So let me um, thank Louise and Ross on behalf of the American German Institute for taking part in this webinar today. Um, and also let me congratulate you on a terrific edited volume that I think will be required reading for anybody interested in German politics, uh, German foreign relations, the transatlantic relationship, European politics, et cetera. So thanks so much and goodbye to everybody that's listening. Goodbye.